Today's interview started when I read an article about Hawaiian quilting in Quilt Mania magazine. These bold two-color quilts sent me down a rabbit hole to find as much about these quilts as I could and the quilters behind them. Today's guest, Sissy Soro, is carrying on her family's legacy of teaching this wonderful style of turned edge applique. Her story is amazing and you don't want to miss it. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea and here's my interview with Sissy Soro. Welcome, Sissy, to the show. Thank you very much for being on. Whereabouts are you coming to us from in the world? I am coming from uh, the state of Hawaii on the island of Oahu in the, I should say, city of Honolulu in the district of Kalihi Valley. <laughs> wow. How did you come to quilting? I came to quilting because it's something that I was born with. My parents were quilters. My great-grandparents were quilters you know, my sister and I, we were just born into it. We would go to grandma's house and on both sides of the family, mom's side and dad's side, and there would be a quilt in the house and you would have, be, you would have ladies quilting. And my mom fell in love with quilting. And so she started quilting, but with her, it was a little different because I'm not sure people realize is that she was only born with one hand. And uh, she just kept watching her grandma quilt and grandma kept saying, no, you can't quilt because you only have one hand. So it was only after, till after she passed away that she told my dad, no, I'm going to learn. I am going to learn how to quilt. And she did. And so she started teaching classes. She became very good at it. She started teaching classes. My dad started being a designer. And before we know it, my sister and I started helping in the classes. And they're not here anymore. And uh, we've continued the classes for them. It's something that's really important to our family to teach this tradition because it's been uh, passed down for many generations in our family. And we, we're still trying to continue it today. Even with the lockdown, we're trying to continue it. So I understand that your school is has been closed because of the lockdown, but you're still you still have all the patterns and yes, our uh, I still have our pattern shop on the internet, uh, and yes, we quilted at the Ilani Palace all around the world. The lockdown here was very difficult, especially for those who do cultural classes, who teach Hawaiian, uh, having to shut down something that was very important to us was very difficult and so with the Ilani Palace shutting down our classes were shut down people were asking if we could open to other places and we decided for the health and welfare of everybody we thought okay maybe this is a sign that we just need to take a break and refuel ourselves <laughs> and but our, my website is still up there I still keep in touch with most of the quilters who are constantly asking when we're going back. And I, we do want to go back soon, but with COVID the way it is, it goes up and down and we don't want to take any chances with the health of our quilters. Now for the viewers that don't know, what is a Hawaiian quilt? It's, it's, it's a good question. And I always start off is a Hawaiian quilt is basically not Hawaiian. It's a, a technique and it's a, art that was taught to us by the missionaries back in the 1820s when they came. They did teach patchwork quilting and the Hawaiians back in, I think it was seen in the 1860s when the quilts design started to change to what you see today. So there was a change from patchwork into the style that we have. What makes Hawaiian quilting Hawaiian is the design. It's cutting out your quilt in one piece. You're using a one eighth design, even a quarter design. And you lay out that whole piece, like exactly how you see here. And you doing the same technique as a quilter in around the world. You're doing the same needle turn applique. You're still doing the same type of quilting, um, but we stylize it to the Hawaiian style, but we quilt like everybody else, but it's the design that makes it Hawaiian. And it's the stories in the quilt that make Hawaiian. So a lot of people will ask us, they say, oh, so Hawaiian quilt has to be made in Hawaii. You go, no, it can be made anywhere in the world. 
And as long as it follows that one eighth design cut out in one piece, it is still a Hawaiian quilt. So that that I'm taking a look at the quilt that you have behind you. So yeah, yeah. you have the white background and you have the green piece on front of on top of it. And that's one piece that you have cut out and turned edge applique. Yes, yes. You can find the fabric for a 90, 90 or 108, 108. So the top, top piece, actually both pieces are joined. We have 245 with fabric join, but it's still cut out in one piece. Was it your father that was the designer? that has all the things right. actually it's funny because my great grandmother on my mom's side was a designer and then she was actually well known in the islands as a designer and she did have quilting uh circles at her home and my grandma on my dad's side so my dad's mom was also a quilter and he it was just it was just funny because when my mom inherited all of my I, I would say my great grandmother's quilt patterns. There were the large 90 by 90, 108 by 108. There was no such thing as cushions or wall hangings. When you went into a quilting class back in the 1930s and prior, you made and cut out a large quilt. So in the 19, late 1960s, 1970s, with my mom telling my dad, I'm going to learn how to quilt. I'm going to do this. He took the large quilt designs and he decided, okay, maybe I can make it smaller, make it smaller for her so she can try. And so what he did, and he was one of the first designers to do that, and he never drew in his life, didn't know about drawing, but he took the larger quilt and he took portions of it and he looked at it and said, how can I make this smaller? And then he came out with the first 30 cushion Hawaiian patterns. And my mom was able to do it. She was able to do it on a smaller piece. And she became very good at it. And people wanted to learn from her. Uh, and I guess the one thing, the reason why they wanted to learn from her, they were wondering is that how can someone with only one hand learn how to applique and quilt? And she became a very good teacher in teaching people on how to quilt. She always would tell people, oh, you have too many fingers. You just have too many fingers. But what happened with the designing is, so my mom and dad started the classes and they were just doing cushions. And the ladies would come up to my dad and say, I want to do a bigger one. I want to do a larger one. And then he kind of looked at the designs and he said, oh, okay, maybe the 90 by 90 is not, it's too big. So why don't we try crib size? So he was the first to design patterns that fit right inside of a baby quilt uh, crib. And so those were 45 by 60s. And then later on, people said, oh, but you know, John, now I want to hang them on the wall. And then he says, well, I don't know if the larger quilt would look good on the wall. So he started designing 45 by 45s. And the ladies work up to say, oh, now I'm ready for the quilt on the bed. And that's how he ended up with 90 by 90 to 108 by 108. The only quilts that got inspired by the ones we inherited from great grandma were the cushions. All the other patterns, his 45, 45, his twin size bed, his 90, 90s were all his own design and his own imagination of what he put into it. The women just absolutely adored him because before he even designed the quilt, he would actually sit with them. And oh, there was a rule though. You had to do a cushion before you even get a bigger quilt. But he would sit them with them and he would say, tell me your story. Tell me about you. Tell me why you want to make this quilt. Is it for you? Is it for someone? And then in putting their story on the quilt, they would more likely complete the quilt. And then it's the story behind the quilt that if even today, if you ask the quilters about their quilt, they can tell you what the story is, why they deci decided, why they decided that colors. And for us in Hawaiian quilting, that is so important as doing a Hawaiian quilt. It's not just a making the quilt. It's the story behind the quilt. With your 
father being a designer and your grandmother being a designer, you must have a huge archive of patterns. And you have no idea. <laughs> it is it is amazing. And we do have some of the patterns on the market, but there are more patterns that are not on the market. And, you know, we, I recently moved into a new house. And so we had to basically um, go through our old residence of where we lived for 39 years and go through things. And I told my sister, I said, I'm finding patterns all over this house. It's like he would draw a pattern and he would just stuff it somewhere or it would be, you know, in a closet or as I go, it just keeps popping up. All these designs keep popping up from him. And we're trying to look into archiving and we haven't had the time yet, but we, we do. We want to get it duplicated, you know, show the whole design because all we have is the eighth. That's all we have. So we have to do the graphics for it and opening up. But the designs are absolutely beautiful. He was very talented in the quilt designing. And he always says he was always inspired by the quilters and his family. And he always gave credit to the quilters. He always, anytime we had meetings or seminars or at the quilting class, and he would say, and he was quite humble, he would say, I am nothing but the designer. You bring it to life. And he always emphasized that. He said, it's just a design on a paper. And until you bring it to life, you make, he goes, you shine. And then he shines also. I would think that your state archives might be interested in some of them as well. They aren't doing patterns right now it used to be at the bishop museum i know we have some out at the white and i library for hawaiian clothing it's a niche and we're not considered a native art because it is not an art that was done before 18 i should say before the missionaries and the whalers came to hawaii so even though it is a traditional art in hawaii it is not considered a native art and and that's the problem that bothers us about that. Yeah, it's a fine line, isn't it? It's a it's a very very fine line, you know. Say, oh well, you you know this is uh, Hawaiian quilting learned by people who came from Boston, and they say, well, you know, it's not native. And but a lot of the old designs that my great grandmother um, passed on to my mom are amazing because we have one quilt called the Kahili o Enia, which means the um, Kahilis of India. And there's a legend that says the Hawaiians may have originated from India because they wear lace and we wear lace. They have your feather standard, your Kahili, and so do we. And so you have many legends within the quilt designs that tells these amazing stories. And I wish the archives or the historians would really look into what the designs mean. Now, is it always a color on a white background? Traditionally, it was always uh, red on white, blue on white, green on white. And the only reason it's traditional is that that's all the fabric that came off the ships. And so with the introduction of new fabric, you'll notice a change in the Hawaiian quilts. So we went from color on white to these really outrageous, which I call the Elvis Presley age, you know, red and yellow, blue and yellow, green and red. They just red, they just went through all different colors. And now we're in the stage of using our batiks. The women love using the batiks. And whatever color you choose doesn't change the pattern. Right. We've had people come up and say, oh, you know, I want to do a red tea leaf or I want to do a red breadfruit and breadfruit is our Hawaiian starch or I want to do yellow taros and we're like, go for it. And they're like, but it's green. It says it doesn't change the design. It never changed the design. The design and story is still in the quilt. And the turned edge applique is only one part of the making of the quilt all the yes. Hawaiian quilts I have seen have all been hand stitched yes they're all hand stitched and you know the ladies did get together to help each other with the quilting we actually emphasize one hand quilts 
we do help the quilters to lay out their quilt, but they're the ones that cut it. Um, we do help with the basting sometimes, but when it comes to the needle turn applique, it's usually just one person do the needle turn applique, but the whole quilt itself is done by hand. And it's always... except for the joining. We don't, I don't like joining the quilts. <laughs> so we, we do put it on a sewing machine. And some of the ladies do the binding, the edging on a sewing machine. And that's fine. I always say, they go, Sissy, but you know, I hand quilted this. And I, I said, you're at the point where you're at the edge. You did everything else fine and great. And I said, so if you want to put that binding in my sewing machine, I said, go for it. <laughs> And, and it depends on them. Yeah. And the quilting pattern seems to trace the outline of your application. Very easy. And people always ask, they say, oh, how do we do the background? And it's, it's your pattern is there. You're just following exactly what you said. Whatever the design is, that is your echo quilting that you're bringing out into the background of your fabric. And that's what we call echo quilting, is that you're going to... Uh, for example, if you have a flower, you're going to echo quilt a line in and a line in and a line in until you have a little circle to sew, and it's all echo quilting. Then we have what we call definitive quilting, and basically you are going to make the quilt flower or whatever you're doing look like the actual flower. So now a lot of the quilts do definitive quilting and echo quilting on their quilts. Now you have an absolutely stunning green quilt there. Is there a story in that quilt? This, uh, the one behind me? Yes. This quilt is called the kukui nut. And the kukui nut is a very important tree in Hawaii. It's also the uh, state tree. And uh, the nut was used for medicinal purposes. The leaves were used um, also for medicinal. The roots were used for dyes. And so that tree was very important in Hawaii. And you've, I see, uh, here I am very nosy here. Oh. I see you've got a red one and now you've leaned back. I see you have a blue cushion. <laughs> Is there <laughs> anything special about those ones? Well, the quilt on the bed, that's called the baby rose. Uh, that has a nice story. That was done by one of our quilters in Japan, uh, Tomiko. And we just basically... In Hawaii, what we do is that we fall in love with people and we just adopt them. And we adopted her, you know, and my dad would call her, you know, her his daughter. And so she made this quilt for my mom. And it's the Hawaiian baby rose. It's just a rose pattern. But the story behind the rose pattern is funny because my mom, when she was a young girl, and she was raised by her grandmother. She wasn't raised by her mom. And she would also... <laughs> She would tell her grandma, she goes, grandma, where do I come from? And her grandma would always say, oh, we found you under the rose bush in the front yard. <laughs> and so that story has lived on in our family forever. And so when she heard about it, she said, I'm going to make your mom a rose bush. <laughs> and that's how we got that quilt. And my dad designed it. He did design it. And yeah, we do have a couple cushions that one is mine and one is my mom. Um, that that we made and so this is has a lay on it so you can see it's from the lay it goes into the center here and then this one is a very old one that my mom did again it's a breadfruit and then if you look at the back you can use whatever backing you want yeah so and your mom did well. that with one hand she did it with one hand that's why she would always, the quilters, you know, they couldn't really uh, talk back to her because she says, I only have one hand. Why are you complaining? You have too many fingers. <laughs> and we would just laugh at her. She's like, mom. <laughs> she goes, yeah, you have too many fingers. And because her, uh, she had a left hand because her right hand cut off at the wrist. So it was just a stump. And she, she was hilarious because she would actually have to put the stump down and then she would applicate this way. And then we went to a quilting class and I told my mom, I said, mom, you need to, I, I said, but I can help you. We need to teach the quilters how to pick up their quilts and sew on their hand. And then she goes, why? I said, because they're quilting with their hand. 
sewing here and their fist was closed. And they were trying to sew like that. I said, they need to open their fingers. And she starts laughing and she goes, oh, I never saw. She goes, I didn't know they were doing that. I go, yeah, they are. <laughs> These Hawaiian patterns, they're part of your family. They're part of your life. Do you do any other type of quilting for yourself? Oh, just Hawaiian, just Hawaiian. I, I, the only thing I know how to do on a sewing machine is do a straight stitch. That's it. Yeah, I no, no piece or anything. But very interesting to know that my mom did do piecing before she went into Hawaiian quilting because she loved to sew. She sewed all of our clothes. She sewed our prom, prom dresses. I mean, she did everything. She loved to sew, but Hawaiian quilting is where her heart is. Now, is there a, another generation coming up? Do you have nieces? and? I, I have two nieces, and I do hope that they pick it up. One niece is like, no. <laughs> and the other niece is, she actually does my pattern shop now. And uh, it, it'll be a slow transition for her actually to do the quilting. She can teach, you know, but, um, well, not teach, but just show them different ways that we teach. And, but yeah, she needs to start. I hope so. One of the main reasons why we started the classes, I should say, my parents started the classes actually is to pass it on. Hawaiian tradition is very, very strict back then. And they would always tell you, don't teach everything. You don't want them to know everything. Or they would, in any Hawaiian culture, um, to teach anything that was within the Hawaiian culture. And uh, they said, you don't want to tell them too much. And my parents came from the school of, in order to pass it on, we need to teach everything. And not just to teach it to the Hawaiians, but to teach it to everybody or anyone who wants to learn and that's how the tradition will continue and so a lot of our emphasis was trying to teach teachers to go out and teach we do have about seven or eight teachers in japan that are teaching and there are quilters that were taking our classes that are now teaching on the mainland and and that's our goal is we don't want this art to die we want it to continue and and we're hoping that it it does do you have a favorite color that you like to use? I'm a green. <laughs> everything, everything I have is green. My car is green. You know, everything is green. And so it's easy. My friend said, oh, sissy, buy her stuff. Easy. As long as it's green, she'll love it. <laughs> so I guess that's why the green is up. <laughs> uh, Hawaii is so beautiful. It has so many shades of green in its forest, in its floral, that, you know, it's just one of my favorite colors. I spent, a, I guess, a month in Hawaii when I was younger. My husband and I had just married. We were on a trip around the world, and we ended up in Hawaii uh, on the island of Oahu. Um, and we lived there for a month. We, uh, we were a couple of weeks in, uh, down in Honolulu, and then the other week we spent on the North Shore in a campsite and we loved it we absolutely fell in love with it we would we always wanted to go back um we were lucky have, to you, have you been back have you been back have you ever been back unfortunately no. not um our ch we had lots of children we had four and that just made every vacation so expensive um and the other the other thing is the time lag like we're we're i'm in toronto uh so it's a whole day of traveling Oh. both to Hawaii and back. And um, that was another thing that just got in the way. Being business owners, we couldn't, we only had, you know, a certain amount of time and we didn't want to spend it on an airplane or in an airport. So. Yeah, um, I hear you because when COVID hit, you know, my sister and I, even my dad, when he was here and my mom, we taught classes on Saturdays, Tuesday, Thursdays. Then it ended up to Saturdays and we never had a Saturday off ever, ever. 20 years, no Saturdays off. And so when COVID hit and we had our Saturdays off, I told myself, I go, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> we have a Saturday. I, I'm not used to having a Saturday off. It's just insane. But to go back to you coming to Hawaii, um, Oahu is beautiful. It's where I was born and raised, but the outer islands are amazing. And if you ever come back, 
visit Kauai and visit the big island of Hawaii because that's where I feel the culture is still alive there and it's still amazing. And the scenery there is, you, you won't see it anywhere in the world. Mm. Then, yeah. If a person was wanting to start to make a Hawaiian quilt, they saw that design and they wanted to make one, how should they start? I, with our classes, and I believe this is the best way to start, is you start with a cushion. We always tell everybody, start with a cushion, start small. And, uh, and the reason why is that we've taught many beginner classes and we can teach 20 in our class and we will probably only have five that really will finish their piece. Uh, quilting is not for everyone. And so when you do your cushion, this is the stage that you can say, loved it, loved it, loved it. I want to do another one. I want to make a bigger one. Or you can say, did it, done it, never going to go back there again. And so we always say, start with the cushion and work your way up to the large piece. We do have a lot of quilters who are wanting to learn because we have closet quilts, many, many closet quilts that our grandparents or great grandparents, their parents, their great grandparents started and never finished it. You know, it's still in the applique stage. It was only basted. It's half quilted. And then they just put it in the closet. And quite a few of the women, they actually come up to us and say, I really want to finish it. So where do I start? We actually start them with a cushion. We start them all the way back from the beginning. I said, let's learn the techniques here. Because at the beginning of when you're working your cushion is when you're improving your stitches. You're perfecting it. So by the time you get to the bigger pieces, your stitches are really nice, they're even, and they're consistent. And so we always say, go back to the beginning. That's where you make all your mistakes. So when you get to the bigger ones, you know exactly what you're doing. So do you teach that online? Do you have an online class? I just did a um, quilting class for a group of ladies in Georgia, and that is posted on YouTube. And uh, it's amazing because we decided to put it on YouTube just to help them out after every, you know, after the sessions and it's doing quite well. And they keep asking me when I'm going to update it. And I know I have to update it. So if you do want to learn how to make a cushion, you can just go to YouTube and just walk a and you'll get three, I think it's three videos on making your cushion. And it goes through the cutting basting, applique, and the final quilting. As far as fabric goes, are you always using cotton on cotton or oh, have you experimented with other fabrics? My mom's a poly blend. <laughs> she did poly blend. She only loved her poly blend. If you gave her cotton, she's like, ah, I don't want to do it. Um, she liked the poly blends because of the colors that it came in. Uh, she said it never faded. It, uh, it was so color fast. And she didn't like pre-washing. So that's why she went with the poly blends. I'm a cotton person. I love working with the cotton. And so it's a preference of the quilter. Uh, sometimes they do mix their, their fabric. And we just said, if you're going to mix, uh, mix your fabric, just remember pre-wash, 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 always pre-wash. Um, even for those who are using poly blends now, we tell them you need to pre-wash, pre-wash all your fabrics. But um, it depends on the quilter. Uh, I don't recommend silk or satin. Or anything. Those are hard to sew and quilt and applique, but um, cottons are the best, I think. What is the beginner mistake that a lot of people make with when they do a Hawaiian quilt or a cushion? Beginner mistakes is, I think a lot of it is just, sometimes they just give up too soon. You know, their stitches are not as nice as they want it to be, and they just give up too soon. And you know, we have to, we actually constantly tell them when you start your applique, just keep going. Don't take your stitches out. Never take your stitches out. Just keep going, continue. And we always promise them that by the time you get to the end, you're going to fall in love with your stitches. And, um, and they do. And, and they, I had one quilter and I just absolutely adored her. She made a tea leaf design. It was a cushion. And uh, she showed it to me and she goes, Sissy, what do you think? And I went, 
oh, okay, it's, it's, it's very nice. You, you worked really hard on it. She says, it's ugly. It's horrible. And I said, okay, so let's do it again. Let's do it one more time. And she did. She cut it out and she did it again. And um, today she's one of our best quilters oh. working on 90 by 90s. And she always remembers that day. She goes, you didn't give up. I said, no, I hopefully we don't give up on anybody. We try not to give up on anybody. But um, it's just, and I think is finding time. Our worlds are so busy right now. You know, it's just set time. Even if it's an hour a day, you know, just don't put it on the side and leave it. You know, just say, okay, from six to seven o'clock, I'm just going to work on one hour. And I say, and you don't know how much that one hour that you can complete. And uh, so we always say, just find time every day to do it. So in the applique of one of those cushions that you just showed me, how many hours do you have invested in it? Just the applique part, not the quilting. We can, the applique of that one, we can do it in three days, four days. If, if you're good at needle turn applique. I know ladies who we've had classes and we start them off one week. The next week, it's all, it's complete. You know, they're ready for the next, you know, step. It depends on the quilter. Some people are really good and fast at it. And some, you know, they take their time. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a matter up to the person, but you can do it, I would say, in a week. We usually say it tell the ladies, you know, two to three weeks is good for an applique, but um, most applicators can do it in one week. So that means those big quilts behind you can take a year of concentrated work. Uh, we averaged it about nine months nine months six to nine months but i do have one quilter who actually quilt i i she's she's an amazing quilter and she actually has done quilts in two months three months wow but that's all she does she quilts all day all night and uh and she has the time and she has the ability to do it and she loves to do it and she is her name is pat garlington and she actually um does a lot of the closet quilts Every time I get a referral and people, you know, they want to finish Tutu's quilt, but they can't do it. Do they know somebody who can do it? I actually recommend it, recommend them to her because she does charge a fee, very small fee. And uh, she finishes at all these closet quilts for these people that they can, you know, put out on their family parties and share with their families. Is there a modern type of Hawaiian quilt as opposed to a traditional style? Yeah, I think there is. You know, my dad kind of experimented and it's caught on is what the, we call reverse applique. And uh, the whole quilt is a reverse applique. And that is a modern type of Hawaiian quilting that um, has caught on. So basically what you're doing is you're cutting out the design and you're actually doing needle turn on just the design itself. So your top fabric, if you're cutting out the design and the design is coming out through the backing. So it's like making a line and then you cut that line and then you're gonna applique that line open. And that's what we, we call reverse applique. And so we do have quilts with just reverse applique. And, and those actually come out. Uh, amazing is there a hawaiian guild yes we do have a hawaiian quilt guild but most of them do contemporary quilting they do patchwork quilting they do crazy quilts uh, there are very few that do hawaiian quilts so i believe on the big island of hawaii they do have a hawaiian quilt guild but we don't have one here on the island my parents were not guild people they, I always call them the maverick. They just walk to their own beat and they never like to join organizations. They want to be part of organizations, but they were always there to support them, help them. Uh, if they needed anything, they were there for them, but they never like to be of one organization. Do you give guild lectures? I've done a couple, but yeah, I haven't done more than, you know, we ask, but yeah, we're, I'm open to doing guild lectures. So if 
guilds want to get a hold of you or people want to sign up for your newsletter for when you open again and your classes, how do people get a hold of you? Pawakalani.com is my website. Yes, I know I haven't updated in a while, which I need to do. And I will be doing that. And I, I, it's all there, you know, where you can contact me if our classes are open or not, if there's any special exhibits that are of interest. And we actually just finished a project for the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, England. And so the um, person who is, I worked with will be here in May to pick up all the quilts and take it back to the museum. Uh, they're a wonderful museum and they are updating archives or their what they have there and they thought Hawaiian quilt would be a wonderful addition to it and so they contacted me and says are you able to get some quilters who would like to be part of this project and I said yeah sure and so that project is almost over it started before COVID COVID hit and then now that it's almost over, the quilts are done and now it can be picked up and uh, they are gonna be a permanent, uh, part of the permanent exhibits in the Pitt Rivers Museum. And it's something I actually like because I will have phone calls and I will have people email me and they said, Sissy, I have this Hawaiian quilt and I wanna donate it to a museum to Hawaii, you know? And I said, why? <laughs> Give it to a museum where you live. How great is that, that somebody, whether it's in Toronto or if it's in New York City, and they can open a Hawaiian quilt and people will say, wow, it's beautiful. It's a Hawaiian quilt. It's from Hawaii. The design, the styling is Hawaii. I said, how much more people can we reach out to if our quilt is somewhere in another museum? I said, there are lots of quilts in Hawaii, beautiful quilts in Hawaii. But some places, some museums have no quilt at all. It'd be nice to share it there. Have you been in contact with the International Quilt Museum? No, we haven't. You know, like I said, my, my I guess I'm living my, channeling my parents. And we don't belong to any organizations. If people need anything, they can always reach out to us. And even for publicity and advertisement my parents never did it they always say oh if they want to learn or if they really want us to help they'll come find us and I said okay that's fine and, and she goes and there's other quilters I went, okay that's good they're amazing they they were so humble in what they did and they everything they accomplished is was through word of mouth and it was through uh, other people finding them and uh, they were they didn't like publicity they didn't like so we do have many interviews and many articles and it was because they came here it's not being arrogant or snob it's that they just wanted to quote and be with their quoters and that was just something that you know happened for them yeah there's a lot of introverts that are are quilters and extroverts don't quite understand when introverts don't want to go out you know yeah, they, think, I, I, they, I think, think there's something wrong and that's not true they are totally comfortable being on their own or with one or two good people good yeah and I, I was usually their contact you know everybody is like okay see sissy go see sissy and I would have to go up to my parents I go do you want to do an interview and they'll look at me like okay <laughs> I said it would really help. It helped promote, you know, what we do and with our quilting and our culture and and who we are. And uh, I said, and it's so important. And I we love our classes. We love all our quilters. It's not just a quilting class anymore. It's actually a quilting family. Uh, we have brought many friends together. We brought many best friends together. I when I was teaching at the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center, we had quite a few of the Japanese ladies who came in and they would actually were so grateful because they, I had like two or three come up to me and said, when I came to Hawaii, I didn't know anyone, anyone. 
I came here because my husband got the job here and I was so afraid to go out. And she said, and I saw your quilting classes and she came to, they came to the quilting classes and they said, now I have many friends and now I have family. And for me, that meant a lot. And that meant a lot to my parents too, that we could make these connections. They're not quilting today, but they made a connection where they found friends, they found family, and they were able to really live here in Hawaii and not be afraid anymore. So that was another important aspect that was part of our quilting classes is with our quilting class, we do have a quilt tree and we have three main tables and we have a beginner's table. And anytime something major happens, all I have to do is call two, three people, one on each table, and that's it. And the word gets out. And I don't have to call every single person. And it's amazing how they're so interconnected with each other that, uh, that we're grateful that we were able to bring a family together with our quilting classes. Did you ever offer like week-long classes, like if people were coming to visit the island, that they could do a class with you? Yeah, we do. We've had classes with women from Australia, uh, actually from all over, and universities, and uh, they would come. And it's usually just one day because it's always their schedule is not um, open because anytime people come to Hawaii, they want to do everything within a week of them being here. And quilting is like, okay, we can, can we, can we get like three hours and then we, we're going to go off to the beach. And it's like, so we try to accommodate them as much as possible within the time period that they're here. Well, thank you very much for being on the show today. I've learned so much and it's been a delight. I love hearing the family history and um, I hope your niece takes it up so you've got another generation. Well, you know, thank you for um, inviting me. And anytime I can go out there and tell people about Hawaiian quilting and how special it is, and uh, it it's helps with the promotion of what we do. Yeah, we do have, hope my niece will do it. But if she doesn't do it, it's okay. Because we have, I think my parents have left an amazing legacy to many quilters and we do have teachers out there and it will go on, it will go on. And uh, that's a promise. And um, it was just wonderful being here and sharing. We, I just love sharing what we do here. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Sissy Siro. My brain is just swimming with ideas of a Hawaiian quilt retreat in Hawaii. If you are interested in her patterns or her classes, I'll leave a link to her social media, her website, and her contact information in the notes below. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Joanna Dermengian, a researcher who is piecing together the forgotten story of how during World War II, Quilters in Canada made hundreds of thousands of quilts for distribution to the war-torn families, hospitals, and soldiers in Britain and in Europe. And you do not want to miss it, so be sure to subscribe. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing on in the background. I have interviewed so many amazing quilters on this series. Let one inspire you. Check out my latest video on summer sewing strategies. Take care and I'll see you next time.